So you address Trump as Donald in a friendly way. He calls me Vladimir, I call him Donald. I mean, you have worked with four American presidents. Once Bush saw something in your eyes. Yes. But things did not go well with Obama, is that correct? Well... Who was it that you felt most at ease with? It is difficult for me to say now. Indeed, I had fairly constructive relations with each of them. But it didn't go well with Obama. Did or didn't. I had good relations with Bush. Did somebody put you at odds with him? What? Did somebody put you at odds with him? No, it has nothing to do with being at odds. It's just that when a person says that... Do you mean Barack? Sorry? Do you mean Barack? Yes. He already stated that the US is an exceptional nation with special, exclusive rights to practically the entire world. I cannot go along with that. God created us all equal and gave us equal rights. So I think it's absolutely ungrounded to say that some people should have exclusive rights to anything. On a scale from 1 to 5, not to make it too complicated, how would you rate Russia's current relationship with the US? I would give it a 3. No, get not a three? Not bad. Between two and three. More like a three, though. Look. And how about earlier? Look, we do cooperate on counterterrorism. I'm serious. It was actually me who called Trump to thank the US for giving us the information. You mean on the St. Petersburg cell? Yes, they had been looking into them for a long time. And after that, the FBI provided this information to the Federal Security Service. Does it mean that the Americans are working better than us on our own soil? They work. I'm not going to talk about it now, because this information is classified. They work globally. I won't tell anyone. I'll whisper it in your ear afterwards. Okay. They work globally, and so do we. Okay. But they were the ones who tracked this case down. That time we did not. Our services track down a lot of them, thus preventing dozens of terrorist attacks. They catch and intercept them several dozen a year. That specific case was detected by the US. I would like to thank them a lot for sharing that information with us. So it's a three now, but what was the peak rate? Well, let's see. Trade turnover used to be higher. It dropped to 20 from 28, still very low. But in the last two years, under Trump, trade turnover started to grow. In terms of security, a while ago we concluded an agreement with Obama. The new start was also signed when he was in office. Now it has not been extended. Just yet. So this raises a question. The US keeps imposing sanctions on Russia. Another question. Take Nord Stream 2. They impose sanctions on this as well. The US has always been against the development of our economic relations with Europe, even in the 1960s when we launched the construction, you remember, the gas for pipes deal? Thank God now we produce large diameter pipes ourselves, which by the way is another recent achievement of our white metallurgy and other sectors. 75%, and this is crucial, 75% of facilities in our manufacturing sector, as well as machinery and equipment, have been manufactured in recent years, in the last 10 to 15 years. This is quite an achievement. They have always been against it. Against Nord Stream 1, they did oppose it. Now they oppose Nord Stream 2 in the same manner. So why did they do it? What for? What was the reason? To ensure transit through Ukraine. Looks a bit strange too, doesn't it? So, they are wooing Ukraine and have introduced external control over it. But they want Ukraine to be sustained by our money as well. They don't want to give Ukraine money themselves. They want Ukraine to receive something from us through transit fees. Okay, we agree. Because following from the growth of gas consumption in Europe in general, and in Ukraine in particular, we too will be interested in it and we will go on with gas transit. The volumes will be lower, but we will continue. However, the main motivation, the excuse for imposing sanctions against Nord Stream 2, was the need to ensure transit through Ukraine. We have signed a transit agreement with Ukraine. So, what is needed now? Sanctions against Nord Stream should be lifted. There are no grounds for imposing them. And if the sanctions remain, it will mean that there is only one motive, to ensure competitive advantages for their LNG, for their liquefied gas. 
The strongest player sets the rules. They are securing a market for their products exclusively in their own selfish interests and at the expense of European consumers. But if the price of a fossil fuel rises by 25 to 30 percent, the competitiveness of the German economy as well as the European one will be undermined. But in fact, in geopolitical terms, Europe from Lisbon to Vladivostok does not exist anymore. But it never existed. Anymore. You're talking now about something which never existed, as if it's something we have lost. Back in the day, de Gaulle spoke about a Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals. Then I extended that idea a little and started saying, why to the Urals? Why not to the Pacific, to the Far East? But I think we should aim for it. Was your Munich speech a novel reaction? Not at all. Now they repeat everything I said. For example, the German leaders. They almost repeated word for word. They were mad at me at the time, angry with me. They said, why did you do that? They took offense. No, got angry. Because, well, it was a bit rude at the wrong time. Why would you do that? And what did I say? I said that it is inadmissible that one country, the United States, extends its jurisdiction beyond its national borders. Today, say the German leadership says exactly that that it is inadmissible that the United States imposes secondary sanctions, i.e. on companies that have no relations to the United States, trying to prevent them from pursuing their national interests. Not only distance, but also our close neighbors started to distance themselves from us in a way. Well, I don't see that. Who exactly started to distance themselves? Take Georgia, for instance. They didn't just distance themselves, they jumped aside. Through no fault of ours. They should thank Mikhail Nikolaevich Saakashvili for that. But he hasn't been around for a long time. Not at all. He is running around from square to square, taking to rooftops like a tomcat. We had a lot of discussions with him on the subject when he was still president. I think Mikhail Saakashvili would recall that. I told him, listen, don't you ever try to deal with South Ossetia and Abkhazia using force. No, I'll never do that, he said. And he still stormed in. He stormed in and got knocked back.